faith factors. We've already looked at Exodus chapter 4, verse 5, Exodus 19 and 9. I want to go tonight to Isaiah 41 and 20. Go to Isaiah chapter 41 as we continue this series called Faith Factors. Things that God does, things that we learn, things that we experience in God that cause our faith to become emboldened, cause our faith to become strengthened, cause it to, uh, our understanding of it to increase. It's not that faith increases, but our understanding of the operation of faith increases. So that's why people say, you know, increase my faith. That's not real. It's really kind of a, a, a misnomer. Faith doesn't increase. You get the measure of faith that you get. What you do with it is the key. How much you understand it, how much you realize the operation of it, how it works, how it functions. Amen. You know, I can get a, I can get a Maserati full of bells and whistles. And, and I may just, you know, turn on the key and just drive it, you know, in, in, in drive, you know, and never use any of all the, the incredible things that are in there. The, the, you know, the turbo power and, and, and you know, has all kinds of stuff in there. And I may never use it. Why? Because I don't know how. Because no one ever told me. Therefore, watch. Therefore, it, I'm, not, I'm not getting the benefit out of everything that's in there. Amen. Faith is the same way. Faith is a vehicle. It takes you from one place to another in the kingdom of God. But if you don't know how it works, then you'll be limited in what you can do. Hello? Not what God can do, what you can do. So that's why I'm trying to help you with this series then called Faith Factors. All right, let's move into this thing then. Isaiah chapter 41 about 710 B.C. Isaiah chapter 41. All right, look at Isaiah 41. I want to pick up at verse 18, and we're going to read down uh, to verse 20. But Isaiah 41 and, and 18, say amen if you have it. Amen. And God says, I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. I will put in the desert the cedar and the acacia, the myrtle and the olive. I will set pines in the wasteland, the fir and the cypress together. Verse 20. So that people may see and know, may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this, that the Holy One of Israel has done created it somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah and god we give you praise tonight for your word and what we're going to get out of it tonight in jesus name amen and amen all right god says i'm going to do certain things i'm going to make rivers flow on barren heights well, you don't have rivers on barren heights. Rivers are in the lowland. They're not above. So already we're seeing a reordering of nature. I'll make rivers flow on the barren heights and springs within the valleys. So you've got a reverse of what is normal. I will turn the desert into pools of water. Everybody say that's a miracle. And the parched ground into springs. How are you going to have dry parched ground all of a sudden turn into a spring? I will put in the desert the cedar and the acacia. Now, those are two trees that only grew in certain arid regions or certain fertile regions with a certain climate and a a certain operation of of, uh, 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 barometric pressure. And it certainly could not grow in the desert. And God says, I'm going to put in the desert the cedar and the acacia. In other words, these aren't supposed to grow there. And the myrtle and the olive. 
you, I, I defy you to find an olive tree in the middle of the desert. Watch. I will set pines in the wasteland. There's another miracle. And the fir and the cypress together, which don't grow together. Because the roots of such will fight against each other. God says, I'm going to do all these things. Why? So that people, everybody say people. People. Now watch this, because the word people there means this, those who are assembled in one accord. Ah. So God says, I can do things, watch this, in a place of unity that I can't do or I won't do where there's disunity. So that people may see or be exposed to and know to realize, may consider or examine and understand or become wise through what they see. Watch that the hand or the power of the Lord has done this or made this happen, that the Holy One of Israel, everybody say Holy One. That phrase Holy One in Hebrew means this, the the one who the saints are to bow down to. That the Holy One of Israel has created it, or the word created there in the Hebrew means brought it about. All right. God was saying, Through Isaiah, I'm going to restore my people back to the land after their exile. And I'm going to bless them. And I'm going to bring abundance back to them again. Nothing then was powerful enough to obstruct the exiles, those who were coming out of exile, out of Babylon, Assyria, back to the land of Jerusalem, back to the land of Israel. Nothing was powerful enough to uh, to obstruct the exiles from God's purpose for them. Nothing could stop them. No difficulty, no obstacle could stop God from doing what He was going to do. They would be a people then capable of overcoming every difficult obstacle no matter what it was they were going to thrive and they were going to flourish the same God who had worked and performed miracles in the Sinai wilderness when Egypt was made and forced to give Israel up and let them go and God takes them through the wilderness that same God who performed miracles in the wilderness of Sinai, would now work even greater miracles in restoring his people. What you have here in verses 18 and 19 is a complete reforestation of depleted areas. And God's saying, I'm not going to do it in a small way. It's not going to be Uh, minuscule and it's not going to be minor i'm going to do it in a major way matter of fact it's going to be so amazing i'm going to do it miraculously and i'm going to reverse nature i'm going to make stuff happen that shouldn't happen i'm going to put stuff where there shouldn't be stuff and i'm going to do it in abundance god's transformation then of this region God's transformation of His creation, listen, happens for the purpose of the transformation of man's perception of God. I'll say it again. God's transformation of His creation happens for the purpose of the transformation of man's perception of God. In other words, He's saying... When I get through doing this, when I get through transforming 
creation, when I get through transforming the depleted area and make it abundant, when I put stuff there that in, in the natural shouldn't be there, when I get through with all of that and I get through blessing and I get through uh, bringing flourishing into a place that was dead and dry, when I get through doing that, when I get through transforming that, what it's going to do is it's going to transform your perception of who I am. So when God does something miraculous, it is so that our perception of who he is is transformed. What God does in behalf of his people, when he moves in behalf of his people, what God does in behalf of his people assures them of his strength to help them and to give them victory. When I see God move, I know he's moving to assure me that he's going to help me. When I see God do miracles, I know he is assuring me that victory is next. I know that God is getting ready to do something. I see him ordering steps. I see him reordering situations. I see him bringing order into chaos. I see him bringing light into darkness. I see him clearing the way where it didn't seem that that way could be clear. I know then that God is about ready to give me victory. God wants us to put our trust in him knowing That when he makes a promise, he keeps it. Because he is absolutely trustworthy. And when I see God do what he said he's going to do, then my faith is strengthened. I'm more apt and more prone to believe him the next time I need him. I'm more apt and more prone to step into an arena of faith and believing for bigger and greater and more powerful and even that which is above what I can ask or think or imagine, as as Scripture says. God says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to move. I'm going to do miracles. I'm going to show you then who I am so your perception of who I am is changed. God never wants to leave you where you are in your assumption or your perception or your understanding or your realization of who he is. Everything he does in your life is to bring you to a greater understanding and realization of who he is. That's why, listen, that's why God has no problem doing miracles. Because every miracle that God does, he does with a purpose. Every miracle that God does, he does with a purpose. Every miracle that God does with a purpose, he does with a purpose. He doesn't waste miracles. He makes sure that they accomplish the purpose for which they were done. What is the purpose? For you to have a greater understanding of who he is so that you can believe him in a greater capacity. The evidence of God's power is the proof of his deity. When God shows up, when God moves, when God manifests, when God stretches his hand, when God creates, when God orchestrates, when God takes that which is not and makes it that which is, every time he does it, no matter what it is, It is the proof of his deity. He's showing you, I'm God. And I do things that nobody else can do. This is the evidence of my existence. This is the evidence of my identity. This is the evidence and the proof of the fact that I am God. And apart from me and beside me, there is no other. That I'm still the Holy One of Israel. I'm still the one that you're to bow down to. I'm still the one that man should serve. When he performs a miracle, it is done with the intent that everyone will see, know, and understand that the eternal God did it. 
that there's no ambiguity, that there's no mistake, that there's no confusion, that it wasn't coincidence. Why? Because you can't, listen, coincidence can't put a river on a barren height. Coincidence can't put a spring in a valley. Coincidence and happenstance can't turn desert into pools of water. A coincidence or an accident cannot make parched ground turn into springs. You cannot, by any stretch of the imagination, put in the desert the cedar and the acacia, the myrtle, and the pine. You can't set a pine in the wasteland along with the fir and the sarvet. You can't do it. It requires a miracle. Man can't do it. Circumstance can't do it. Happenstance can't do it. It requires a miraculous move of the power and the hand of God. And when God does these things, He does it for the purpose that we understand that He is God Almighty and that He still does what He says He can do. Not only does He do it so that we see and know and understand that He's the eternal God and that He does these things, but also... We understand then that He alone is the source of all that is good. We don't mistake it. We don't say, well, you know, uh, you know, good fortune gave this to me. It was luck. No, it was God. It wasn't some other idol. It was God. It wasn't Baal, it wasn't Chemosh, it wasn't Molech, it wasn't any of these gods that the Israelites were inclined to and and conjured into worshiping by other nations. And God said, you better understand that when you see a miracle, I did it. None of these other gods did it. They're not gods at all, they're dead. They're, 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 They're demons that they're worshiping. I alone am God. And I want you to know that I alone am the source of everything good. When he acts to deliver, when God moves, when God performs in order to deliver and transform, to change things, to Make a way where there seems to be no way to provide for you in your desert place. Whatever it is that God is doing of a miraculous nature that can't be done any other way. Whenever he acts that way, it's done for the purpose of strengthening our faith. God says, I want to strengthen the faith I gave you. I want your faith to be strong. God doesn't want us walking around weak in our faith. I don't know if I believe. I believed yesterday. I don't know if I believe today. No, 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 no. Well, I'm not sure. God wants you to be able to stand up and say, I know that I know that I know that I know. Because he did it before. If he did it before, he'll do it again. God wants you to be strong in the faith. So when he moves and he acts to deliver and transform, it not only strengthens faith, but watch, but it makes faith, listen, this is good, it makes faith the predominant posture of his people. How are you standing? What's your posture? I'm standing in faith. Yeah. I'm positioned in faith. I'm expectant that God is going to do it. I'm not beat down, broken down. I'm not forlorn. I'm not walking around my head down and my hands dragging on the ground. I am standing strong in faith. My posture is one of faith. When God does these things, it's so that We understand not only who he is, that he is the God who does what he said he's going to do, but that it makes faith the predominant posture of his people. So when people see you, what are you doing? I'm in faith, man. Where are you? I'm in faith. How are you standing? I'm standing in faith. 
What's your position? Faith. What's the ground in which you stand? Faith. What are you moving in? Faith. Uh, what are you looking at? Faith. Uh, I'm moving by faith. I'm walking by faith. I'm living by faith. I'm living by faith in the God who does exactly what he said he's going to do. When God moves in your life, it's so that faith becomes your predominant posture. So that people look at you and they see you in faith, not in doubt. God gets glory out of it. When people see you in faith, God gets glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Say with me, faith. Needs to be my predominant posture. That means it's to rule over any area of doubt in my life. When I wake up in the morning, my predominant posture must be that of faith. When I go through my day, no matter what's going on, the predominant posture of my attitude and my mind and my heart and my spirit must be that of faith, not doubt. Yeah. When something is predominant, it means it takes its place over everything else. Amen. Faith must always take its place over doubt and fear and unbelief. Yes. Miracles, when God does miracles, and I'm glad that He does, and I'm glad that He does them here. Hallelujah, somebody. Miracles call faith to attention. Faith is in you. To every man has been given a measure of faith. So miracles call your faith to attention. Your faith springs up when it sees a miracle. Your faith is buoyed up when it sees a miracle. Your faith comes alive. Your faith is quickened when you see a miracle. What happened here a couple of weeks ago? Everybody's faith was quickened. Hallelujah. And the last report is that she's going into, she went to the therapist and, 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 and that progressive miracle that we said was going to happen is happening. Out of a wheelchair after seven years. And now taking more and more steps. Come on, somebody. Well, what does that do? That, that calls your faith to attention. Your, your faith goes, hey, I'm here ready to report for duty. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to move. I'm ready to move into activity. I'm ready to move into operation. I'm ready to believe. I'm ready to trust. I'm ready not to doubt. I'm ready not to be afraid. I'm ready to move toward the things of God. Amen. Miracles call faith to attention and they make God the focus, listen, of our capacity to believe. God becomes the focus of my capacity and my ability to believe because that's what faith is the ability to believe so then God not man not circumstances not situation not the elements not the natural realm everything in me that is faith oriented begins to focus on God as the object of my faith every divine miracle is calculated say it's calculated to provide change in the faith level of those who behold it. Every miracle is calculated to provide change in the faith level of those who behold it. When God does a miracle, He does it so that my faith changes in its focus. So that I put more faith in Him than I did before. That I use everything that I'm equipped with to believe Him with. 
God says, watch, I'll do a miracle. And once I've done it, I expect you to believe me more and more and more than you ever did before. I expect you to move in faith more than you do in doubt. I expect you to move more in the direction of believing me than not believing me. Miracles astonish unbelievers' doubt. But they affirm believers' faith. Miracles astonish unbelievers' doubt. All throughout the New Testament, when Jesus did a miracle, the unbeliever, the skeptic, the Pharisees, the ones who always looked askance at what he was doing and were trying to find fault, what did it say? It says they were astonished. They were amazed. What the heck? It astonishes the doubt of an unbeliever, but it affirms the faith of a believer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The reality of the efficacy of the acts of God reveal His omnipotence and they portray Him in ways that change our perspective of who He is. When I see Him do what He said He will do, when I see Him work a miracle, when I see the reality of his power, when I see the reality of the veracity of what he does as he reveals that he is all-powerful, his omnipotence, it portrays him in a way that changes my perspective of who he is. He said, I do all these things so that, everybody say, so that, so that they may see and know and consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this, that the Holy One of Israel has created it. Anybody ready to see more miracles of God so you can believe Him in a greater way and you can give Him the glory. If you do, stand to your feet tonight. God, we give you praise. We thank you for your word. We thank you for everything in it that has come out of it. We thank you for what we've received tonight by your spirit, and we give you glory. Bless your people now in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless.